I think it's time to begin. Welcome to the webinar for this evening with the South African Institute for International Affairs. Uh, this is the Western Cape branch, but we are online, so we're global, uh, which is a great thing. And we are welcoming our speaker this evening, Brooks Spector. Uh, I will be introducing him shortly. I'm Martha Bridgman. I'm a member of the EXCO with uh, an interest in US-South African politics and their relationship. So I, I'm pulled in to moderate this. But I have been part of Sci Western Cape for a good few years. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I would like just to make note of a couple of uh, housekeeping points as well as some upcoming events. One is that there will be an opportunity to present uh, questions. We would ask you to please type those into the Q&A box. Um, I know there is the chat section on Zoom, but we uh, would like to be using the Q&A so we can keep track of what's been addressed and perhaps questions that overlap. Uh, secondly, if you do want to uh, contact one of the panelists, you will see the option to do that. There is a team in the back room handling those things and we'll be um, able to respond to any queries, especially if there are technical difficulties that you pick up that we should be aware of. In terms of upcoming events for uh, the end of the year, we have this year, obviously with the COVID lockdown in South Africa, we have been unable to hold uh, meetings in uh, physical presence. Uh, but we will be uh, venturing into that space on the 25th of November. We will be hosting a meeting with Hussein Solomon speaking on the crisis of democratization in the Middle East and North Africa. That meeting will take place uh, following our annual general meeting at 5 p.m. on that date. Is everything all right, Brooks? We're good. I just wanted to turn the light okay. on because of the shadow. Okay. So if I may introduce you. I actually have known Brooks for many years, going back to the days when he was a US Foreign Service officer and I was doing my uh, doctoral dissertation research on US policy towards South Africa. J. Brooks Spector settled in Johannesburg after a three decade career as an American diplomat in Africa and East Asia. Post retirement, he has taught at the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg. He's been a consultant for an international NGO. He, run, he has run a famous Johannesburg theater. I'm assuming you mean the Market Theater, is that right? Well done. Yes, and he's been a commentator for South African and international media across print, broadcast, online uh, uh, platforms. In addition to writing for the Daily Maverick from day one, you might recognize his name if you follow that publication. Uh, Brooks has also been a Bradlow Fellow with SIA uh, and a writing fellow of the University of Johannesburg's Institute for Advanced Studies. I'd love to hear more about that sometime. In addition to his frequent journalism contributions, he has written a number of professional studies on international relations issues for South African and other organizations. And just on a personal side, he says only half humorously, he assures us, that he learns uh, that everything he needs to know about politics, he learned from the film Casablanca. Perhaps we'll have a few juicy quotes from that uh, maybe sprinkled throughout this webinar. Uh, and he believes that he might be increasingly cynical about some things, but Beethoven Spring Quartet, uh, a late Beethoven Spring Quartet, any music from John Coltrane or a dish of, and I'm going to try and pronounce this Indonesian delicacy, soto ayam, almost, um, uh, um, can bring him close to tears. So we'll hope that this webinar does not bring him close to tears. There's a lot of big issues to talk about. We're going to be discussing the 2020 US presidential elections uh, coming up on the 3rd of November. and he'll be looking at how will the, the outcome affect the rest of us. So on that note, unless there are any questions from uh, the back room, I'd like to turn over to Brooks. Well, good afternoon to you all. And thank you, Martha, for that introduction. Uh, 
And one of the things, of course, about doing one of these webinars is there's no chance to mix and mingle afterwards with everybody holding a glass of wine or soda. So I hope that when we get to Q&A that we'll be able to simulate some of that, at least with interesting or thoughtful or even provocative questions. Well, let me get right to the heart of the topic here, where we are, in fact, uh, with this topic, we're right on the cusp of the electoral discussion uh, as it's happening in the U.S. Later this evening, uh, in American time, and early, early Friday here, the second and what is now final uh, U.S. presidential candidates debate will take place. Now, if you've got a, if you've got the dedication of a saint and the stamina of a Clydesdale wagon horse, you can get up at 2 a.m. and watch it with me. Otherwise, you'll have to watch the replays and the commentaries thereafter. The debate is supposedly going to have a major focus on foreign policy issues, including the questions of climate change. Uh, and that, of course, is unless the president goes off on another rampage about uh, Burisma and the New York Post story about purloined Hunter Biden hard drives or something similar. That will make it more exciting, but perhaps less useful for voters. Now, watch for charges that Joe Biden is somehow the, uh, the what, what I think is the correct term here, the, the gormless tool of those nefarious folks in Beijing, and then sim simultaneously watch Donald Trump attempt to wriggle away from charges that he is painfully obsequious toward Vladimir Putin, and that he probably has never met an authoritarian he just didn't love. Now, the first debate, uh, it is now, I think, universally accepted, was not a success for Donald Trump. That, I think, is a statement very few people will disagree with. In large part, it confirmed a portrait of him as a bully, foul-mouthed, arrogant, and fatally ignorant. And speaking diplomatically, very diplomatically now, it was probably the worst demonstration of democratic practice I've ever witnessed in my entire life. Now, the voters and citizens were hoping for deeper understanding about differences on policy issues. They sadly didn't find them amidst all the shouting. But there was actually one saving grace, uh, unexpectedly. Climate and environmental issues actually showed up in the Q&A, and there was some vigorous discussion about it. Joe Biden's task uh, in that debate was to look and sound like a responsible adult and potential president, and in his demeanor and his answers to questions, to not go wandering off into strange verbal non sequiturs, something he has been known to do in the past. For, the, for many of those 80 million or so viewers who were watching it live, uh, not us political junkies who've been following Joe Biden's trajectory since he broke into, into Paul Biden. A second direct engagement was killed by Donald Trump's unwillingness to engage uh, virtually with his uh, opponent. Still, the two parallel town halls on TV last week on competing channels, they reinforce, I think, for most people, Joe Biden's seriousness and maybe some of his ponderousness and earnestness, and a command of detail. Um, Donald Trump's task in that first debate was to gather in and strengthen ties with his debate, with his base, to win converts to his cause beyond that core, and not give vent to favorite conspiracies or engage in ad hominem attacks. In that sense, then, uh, for Donald Trump, it was an epic fail. It really was. It was sad to watch, and oh, there it was. A major difference with the 2016 election this year, however, is that uh, realistically, how many people still remain undecided that by now? And to whom, therefore, are the candidates actually appealing? Uh, it is important. It is unique. It is new. Uh, it is earth-shattering for American politics. There are perhaps 45 million or so people who have already voted, and so any opinion they have is now baked in, and no evidence from the second debate is going to have any effect on them. This election, then, in contrast to 2016, becomes a referendum 
on Donald Trump's four years, rather Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, or they were both well known in a way, but neither of them had been president. Um, in contrast to 2016 as well, very few voters will be thinking about the real non-entities running for third and fourth parties this year. In 2016, um, there were two parties, the Green Party and then uh, I forget the other name, uh, the fourth party uh, that drained off significant votes. And some people argue that it, it ended up costing Hillary Clinton the election uh, because you only needed uh, somewhere around 10,000 votes in Michigan and uh, roughly the same in Wisconsin and a little bit more in Pennsylvania. And she certainly would have won those states and therefore would have become president. Um, in 2016 further, uh, there was at the last minute, the, the polls revealed that there was a significant shrinkage of what had been a considerable pool of people who were not yet decided. And that seems to have made a difference as well. Nonetheless, with a national audience of about 80 million people initially, and no one's quite sure how many online or in rebroadcast or people who watch segments, um, the two candidates presumably uh, reached some people who, while eligible to vote, had not done so previously. And this uh, presumably comprises mostly younger people and those who up until that moment had failed to register to vote. So you can argue at least that with voting for presidential elections around 60% of the eligible voters, uh, there still are some people to reach hypothetically. Now in that first debate, uh, the failure of Chris Wallace of Fox News as the moderator to keep a tight leash uh, has actually reopened the whole notion of, the, of having these debates, the structure, the style, the purpose. By contrast, on the one on, on the separate uh, town hall meetings, uh, Savannah Guthrie of NBC did show what a determined interviewer or moderator can do to put somebody on the spot and force them to answer serious questions and to not let go until the question has been answered. Uh, the Trump uh, candidacy and campaign didn't like it very much, but the, the audience who watched it appeared to, to appreciate the effort. The state of the race now, we're, we're what? We're less than two weeks away. And if you read the polling data, and Martha and I talked about polling briefly uh, the other day, uh, the current polling indicates that Joe Biden maintains a lead of 10% plus or minus over the incumbent president. Now, interestingly, that lead has stayed roughly the same really since Joe Biden uh, took the lead in the Democratic primaries. Um, but now national polling, of course, doesn't tell us the full tale, um, assuming they're accurate, and we can talk about that later if you want. This, what they call the swing states matter. Swing state simply means a state in which the population is relatively evenly divided between the two parties and two candidates. And in this year, uh, the swing states comprise Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania and also Florida, Arizona, North Carolina, Iowa, and maybe even Georgia and Texas. Now, if all of those were to go toward Joe Biden, he would be president in a, in a landslide in what is being called the blue tsunami. Uh, that probably won't happen. So the attention now focuses like a laser beam on the, vote to the voter preferences in those swing states. Within those states, of course, it isn't simply a, all the people moving back and forth. Uh, much of the attention has to go to smaller groups within the uh, population of voters. And especially now, the key demographic sections, suburban college-educated white women, over 65, voters over six age over 65 and black and brown voters and the gender split here is actually quite critical and it is here that joe biden 
uh, has had and continues to have an enormous lead. And this may well be uh, the ultimate answer as to how the election was won by Joe Biden, assuming he wins. Um, the president appears to have become rather nervous about this uh, in recent days, in recent camp, in recent campaign stops. Uh, in one, he was he was heard saying to, and this is addressed to white suburban women: "Please like me, like me. You've got to love me. I've saved your suburbs." And that is a not so very subtle allusion to the idea that suburbs are being quote unquote invaded by others. And the problem with this is that um, nationally American suburban uh, demographics, about 35 to 40 percent are ethnic minorities. And so there isn't, for the most part, a sustained whites only suburban uh, circumstance among um, among voters in those suburbs. Um, and then most recently, he was heard ranting is the only way to describe it about the pressure, the water pressure in dishwashers uh, that the, the Obama administration had lowered the water pressure in dishwashers. I swear I'm not making this up and that he had uh, changed the regulation so that the water pressure would be higher and your dishes would become cleaner. These all seem to be something of vain attempts to reestablish a relationship with white suburban college educated voters. Um, now there's been an enormous amount of polling, of course, Americans love polls, but it is, it is crucial to remember that polls are not predictive, they're descriptive, they're snapshots of an opinion at the time that they are taken. And as a result, rather than dwell on just one poll, it's best to follow those organizations that have been doing what are called polls of polls. Uh, 538, uh, the Economist Analytics Office, and similar ones. But most important, it, ne it needs to be said, people need to follow those state-by-state -state polls because that's where it's going to come down. And that's because of the structure of the way Americans vote for the president. Now, unlike uh, numerous recent elections, mostly since my childhood, effectively, the nation is now going to have to reconcile itself to the idea that the final answer of who won will not come from election day or the morning thereafter. It may take some days more as all of those mail-in and advance votes get counted, checked, and rechecked. And therein, of course, lies the possibility of mischief on the part of X uh, and legal obstructions and wrangling uh, that has been so much in the news as possible. Uh, think of all the lawyers who are getting ready for this. Um, a brief word about the electoral system explains why the state polls matter. Uh, unlike South Africa or most countries, uh, the voting in the United States is effectively as if there are 50 separate individual votes, state by state by state. And you win a state by one vote in theory, and you get the entire electoral weight of that state. Electoral weight simply means, relatively speaking, its population weight as a percentage of the national total. Now, the way that's and the way that is expressed is there are uh, five. There are 435 members of the House of Representatives. There are 100 members of the Senate. There are three more electors given to the District of Columbia, that's Washington, D.C., for a total of 538. So simple mathematics tells you you win 270 of the electoral votes distributed wherever they are, um, and you win the election. This has its origins in the founding fathers of the American Constitution, uh, deciding they were really very nervous about a broad-based direct electoral system. And so they, they opted for what I, I refer to as the Plato model of indirect selection. The original idea was that the voters in, in the states would elect electors who would be senior, uh, serious, somber, graybeards of citizens 
who would then pick the best man for the presidency, man because at those times women didn't have the right to vote, uh, African Americans obviously didn't have the right to vote, and if you didn't own property, you didn't have the right to vote in almost every state as well. Looking now where we are, what are the issues that are driving this election? And I would argue on the basis of the statistical data that I've seen in the polling, that almost everything now centers on the pandemic. Sorry, just a sec, turning the page, okay? Um, the economy, well, the economy is, cl is clearly connected to the pandemic uh, because without the pandemic, the, the economy would not have been largely shuttered. Healthcare, connected to the pandemic, of course, and people over 65 and others now have grave fears about what the Republicans might do to the Affordable Care Act, so-called Obamacare, what they might do to Social Security and what they might do to Medicare. Even um, race is now connected directly to the, to the COVID pandemic because it has come to the attention of most people that there is a racial differential in the death rates. Um, the darker your melanin is, the more likely it is you come down with the, with the disease. Law and order, racial tumult, racial redress, they're tied in some ways to the economy, which of course is tied back to the pandemic. There are other issues, uh, the environmental question, climate change, which has been occasioned especially because of those vast fires in California and the rest of the West. And then what we'll call presidential chaos, the inability of the Trump administration to have an orderly management system for dealing with issues. And most lately, the realization that Donald Trump doesn't pay his fair share of taxes. Now, those are very difficult hills to climb if your argument as the president's is, if your argument is that he's been good for the country, the economy, except for the pandemic, has been wonderful, and that uh, I'm, I'm looking out for you, and I am uh, standing behind law and order. You have all these other things that affect people rather more directly. Sorry, just a second. Um, excuse me. Would you believe a, uh, Mike Pence is fly, not Mike Pence is fly, but a fly just landed on me. And I, rather than Mr. Pence, I thought I would get rid of it. Um, turnout is the great imponderable, of course. And that usually is, has been presidential levels around 60%. But as I said earlier, the data says that many people are already voting or already have vote. And the projections are that this is going to be a much higher rate of voting than in the normal run of things. One other thing you need to keep in mind as you pay close attention to American elections, it isn't just the president that is being selected. 35 of the 100 senators are up for election or re-election or a new person trying to get one of those seats. Um, 23 of them are Republican held now and 11 are held by Democrats. And the 435 congressmen are uh, all up for grabs. And there are thousands of other offices. Uh, somebody did a survey of it and they concluded there are 80,000 elected offices in the United States. So you can see what it looks like on most ballots. Now, looking forward to the future, Looking to the future, if there is a Biden administration, what are the key elements of Biden policy in foreign affairs? Um, will it be good for the American economy and thus the world's economic fortunes? How to rebuild trust with allies and adversaries alike? alike. Those are going to be first orders of business in January when the president is inaugurated. Um, the other day, uh, thinking about foreign affairs, I wrote in the Daily Maverick, by the time Obama left office in 2017, the conversation about America's place in the world had become one of making the best possible accommodations uh, in a world that was no longer dominated by the United States. That's a commonplace observation, but it has profound implications for what the president does. 
Um, then in 2017, as far as the incoming president, Donald Trump, was concerned, he saw his task as, as he said, make America great again, whatever that may have meant, but not crucially any sense about dominating the world. As a result, his mantra became America first, not, as you might have expected, fix the world. Uh, or as New York Times editorial board member and, and one of their senior foreign correspondent veterans, Serge uh, Shema, Shememan, his name has always confounded me, reminded us the other day, and I'll quote from his, his writing in a column, the troubles of the world are not all Mr. Trump's doing. China's rise, Russia's machinations, the tenacity of Mr. Maduro, the sectarian feuds in the Middle East, and the new crop of authoritarian rulers were all underway before he was inaugurated, and they would have taxed any president. And accordingly, therefore, whoever wins this election confronts the same realities and challenges. Uh, the columnist goes on to say, many of the dominant currents of the world, excuse me, too over-enthusiastic with the page turn there, many of the dominant currents of world affairs will not change a result as a result of a change in administration or tone in Washington, Russia will still meddle in foreign elections. China will demand a role commensurate with its wealth and military might. Europe will contribute too little for its defense and a reconfigured Middle East will still be buffeted by sectarian social and ethnic divisions and so forth. And so Joe Biden and Donald Trump, either one of them will be forced to deal with these same realities. And the challenge is to understand how they will choose to accept this reality of less in influence and power and how they'll respond to the global challenges regardless. For the Biden camp, it's likely to, to be a need to accept, even embrace the idea that full on flat out globalization and internationalization in economic and trade relations actually has real trade-offs that can have negative impacts on large swathes of the nation, national economy and its workers. But globalization is not necessarily the big evil. Disengagement is worse. Biden policies as a result will have something of the texture of a new, new and improved flavor in, of the Obama administration. So we'll call it Obama 2.0. And fortuitously, Joe Biden, under, at least under his name in an article in Foreign Affairs in March, April of this year, uh, gave some real detail about the kinds of things he saw as foreign policy concerns. And he wrote, or his namesake wrote, by nearly every measure, the credibility and influence of the United States in the world as will have diminished since President Barack Obama and I left office on January 20th, 2017. President Donald Trump has belittled, undermined, and in some cases abandoned US allies and partners. He's turned on our own intelligence professionals, diplomats, and troops. He's emboldened our adversaries, et cetera, et cetera. Meanwhile, the global challenges facing the United States from climate change and mass migration to technological disruption and infectious diseases have grown more complex and more urgent. And the international system that the United States so carefully constructed is coming apart at the seams. Trump and demagogues around the world are leading, are leaning, excuse me, leaning into these forces for their own personal and political gain. The next president will have to address the world as it is in January 2021, and picking up the pieces will be an enormous task. He, and she, he or she will have to salvage our reputation, rebuild our confidence in our leadership, and mobilize our country and our allies to rapidly meet new challenges. There will be no time to lose. The key takeaways from the Biden article as it went further was to, to do this successfully, they would, the Biden administration would need to reinvigorate democracy at home, build a foreign policy that takes into consideration the needs and interests of the American middle class, and then put the United States back at the head of the table rather than sitting off on its own sitting away from things, uh, looking inward, and then ultimately be prepared and be ready for the need to lead. We must once more harness the power and rally the free world to meet the challenges facing the world today, as he says. Um, I think what this means in specifics is that a Biden administration 
would re-embrace and re-engage with the country's alliance structures in Europe and East Asia as the most reliable and most cost-effective cost means to counterbalance the ambitions of Russia and China. My reading of it is that the Biden administration would reorder, reorder priority, priorities back toward international efforts to deal with climate change, epidemiological disasters, and nuclear proliferation, and more open trade regimens. Specifically for Africa, it's less clear, but a key question will be what will replace AGOA, the African Growth and Opportunity Act, which is American law, not a treaty, let's keep that in mind, when it expires in 2025. Will there be more of a push for the Power Africa Initiative? Will there be negotiations with a still relatively amorphous All Africa Free Trade Compact? Or just at the minimum, more attention? Um, it's useful to remember, I think, that when Joe Biden was a senator, he was one of the leading proponents in the Senate for the Comprehensive Anti-Apartheid Act back in 1986 and gave a, uh, a fairly fiery speech about that at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee when he was a member and chair. And I believe, and I can't find the data because it's a long time ago, that he gave a presentation with SIA or two SIA members on a trip to South Africa that also articulated his opposition to apartheid within the broader context of human rights. What that means perhaps is that we shall see at least more attention to Africa, even if it will be, it will be limited by all the other issues that will be forced upon him. Uh, by contrast, um, and I was looking uh, today for a terse statement uh, by the Trump administration about how it sees its grand strategy. And just by accident, I found one from Nadia Shadlow, who was a former deputy national security advisor in the Trump administration. And she'd written in the October, November issue of Foreign Affairs, since the end of the Cold War, Cold War, most US policymakers have been beguiled by a set of illusions about the world order. On critical issues, they have seen the world as they wish it were and not how it really is. President Donald Trump, who is not a product of the American foreign policy community, does not labor under these illusions. He has been a disruptor and his policies, informed by his heterodox perspective, have set in motion a series of long overdue corrections. Well, yes, I guess you could say that. Um, now, closer to home, I read something the other day by one of the senior figures in Investec, Dr. Greg Klein, um, and he was arguing uh, that in contrast to the previous support for AGOA by all American presidents who have been governed by it, while $9 billion worth of trade is estimated to transact between the two countries, South Africa and the US, the Trump administration has reviewed the agreement and identified South Africa as being restrictive and as such, agreement renewal in its current form would not be guaranteed under a Trump administration. Yes, that should be a concern. And to return to Mr. Schmiemann again, if Mr. Trump is reelected, he will conclude that he has a mandate to continue his dysfunctional statesmanship and the world will have no choice but to conclude the past four years were not an aberration, but they will be the United States they now have to live, have to deal with. The upcoming election really does offer, I think, a stark choice in governing styles, but it's more than just style. The choice offers American voters a way to indicate which direction the country will turn in dealing with America's more limited action, more limited freedom of action, the constrainment of choices, and an ability to affect the further the future of the, of the globe. And I think I should stop there because that is, now I've gone beyond my time, I believe. I've gone to about 40, 48 minutes. So Martha, I will turn it back over to you and let you build the rest of the afternoon. Thanks very much, Brooks. You have given us quite a range of uh, points to consider. And we have several questions. We have seven questions already uh, submitted, some of which are quite complex. 
So if you don't mind, I'll just jump in and give you, uh, I'll read the, the questions as they've come through. Um, some of them have to do with the actual election process. Some okay. have more to do with uh, a Biden presidency versus a Trump presidency going forward, especially with regard to China. Mm -hmm. um, and some are looking at more technical questions like how would you address healthcare and the economy at the same time. But let me start with the first. Sheila Kammerer asks, when it comes to the vote count, are the political parties not allowed to have observers throughout to ensure the integrity of the election? And this is a basically election process in the US. You know that it's very much handled on a local basis district by district, but maybe you can give uh, an answer to that. Should I answer the one or all together? Yeah, I think so. Well, let's start with that one. A few of the others are more related, but that one is sort of out there. Okay. Um, it, in simple terms, as, as uh, Martha was indicating, uh, managing the electoral process in the United States is a state it's a state power. It's not a federal government power, except for some regulatory effort over funding and the way money is raised and how it is spent and how much can be raised from any one source. And for example, that it can't be raised from foreigners or foreign entities, legally at least. Um, but both parties traditionally uh, and legally are entitled to have observers in all of the polling stations and in the rooms where votes are counted, but they are not allowed to say anything or do anything to obstruct that process. They can, however, note irregularities and call it to the attention of higher level individuals within their party. And if it is, if it is uh, un, uh, unpleasant enough or uh, problematic enough, uh, then they wheel into lawyers and off we go to court for an injunction or uh, a stay of, of some version or another. But as a, this has been confounded a little bit by Donald Trump's uh, urging for his supporters to go to the voting stations, to go to the polling stations and monitor the elections as if this doesn't happen otherwise, when in fact Republicans and Democrats, both historically, traditionally, and legally, do precisely that already. Thank you, Brooks. We have a question uh, that addresses something that is very topical of the Supreme Court question. Um, it doesn't, looking at the Trump nominee and how quickly that's being put forward or why, but from Roger Southall, he's asking if, if you think Biden would have, I'll say, the guts to increase the Supreme Court to 11. I know he actually made a statement in response to something about that today, didn't he? Um, yes. Sorry, yep. Roger has a few other questions about process. For instance, increasing states to include Washington, D.C. and Puerto Rico and changing the electoral college system. So basically it's asking, is Biden willing to get in there and make some of these changes that would have a long-term structural uh, impact on the way elections take place? Uh, those are all important questions and they're, and they're being debated furiously uh, in newspapers and on talk shows and uh, among everybody who has an interest in politics generally. Um, the Supreme Court, in the Constitution itself, there is no specific number set for the Supreme Court number of judges. Uh, at the beginning, I believe it was five, then it was raised to seven, and it's been nine for the last hundred and some odd years. But there's no specific reason why it must be nine or five, or seven, or 13, for that matter. Uh, I Obviously, an odd number is, is, is important, because otherwise mm -hmm. you end up uh, it, with the possibility of forever getting to tie votes, which would simply mean that the previous, uh, the judgment from the lower court uh, is sustained, and go away, please, because that's the end of that case. Um, the Biden position on what is popularly termed court pack, Supreme Court packing has been problematic for him. Let's put it that way. Um, the uh, more leftward parts of the Democratic Party are pushing for it because they can see the reality that if the newest nominee is confirmed, which is quite likely, obviously, um, it will be a permanent 
6-3 conservative majority for decades because she is relatively young. I mean, certainly by, by my age standard, she's, <laughs> she's practically a child. <laughs> She's 48, um, yes. Yeah, hey, I mean, you know, she uh, technically, you know, biologically, she could be my kid. Um, <laughs> um, but no, in all seriousness, um, the, uh, the, what it means in practice is that there would be a 6-3 or 5-4 conservative uh, slant to almost all considerations and judgments. And there are a lot of, ju- there are a lot of issues that are coming before the court uh, that have a, a specific kind of ideological component to them, as well as cases that might well arrive on an expeditious uh, basis directly from the election. Um, mm. And so uh, the Biden proposal, which I heard this morning, uh, I haven't read the whole thing, obviously, but uh, was to have a commission to study the entire mm. federal judiciary um, and its structure and the numbers of judges and the layers and levels, which presumably would include uh, the question of the number of Supreme Court justices. Uh, The one constitutional provision that can't be touched easily is terms of office. Unlike South Africa, which have delineated terms, Supreme Court justices serve until they either retire or die. And uh, that means that you have someone like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who held on until literally uh, it was her time. Uh, You have somebody like William O. Douglas, who stayed on for decades and decades until he was in a wheelchair and very ancient, uh, waiting for uh, a Democratic president to replace him. Um, And so all those things would be part of the Biden plan to consider questions. Well, that's clever. You know, when in doubt, appoint a committee. Mm. Uh, get you out of a problem. Um, but that's not going to satisfy some people in the Democratic Party, especially those who want to see more wholesale, uh, even revolutionary changes in the way the Supreme Court uh, is structured or its size or even its terms of office. Um, the second question there, uh, increasing um, Senate members and their and uh, House of Representatives representation in the Congress um, for most especially Puerto Rico and the District of Columbia. The Washington DC already does vote in presidential elections but has no voting representation mm-hmm. in the Congress. Puerto Rico, the deal for Puerto Rico is that everyone there is a citizen but they only vote if they have moved to the continental United States and set up residence there. Uh, but as a consequence of that, they're not subject to federal income taxes. And that, that's, been the, that's been the bargain. And in the one referendum that was held where the choices were independence, um, the status quo uh, as a commonwealth, <clears throat> or to push for statehood, the status quo won, but there are arguments that maybe the, the questions weren't phrased right or opinion has changed because that was years and years ago. Um, for Democrats, this is becoming something of an article of faith because it would almost guarantee four more Democratic senators mm-hmm. and several, uh, the minimum, uh, the, the, the one, uh, five or six members of the House of Representatives, and in the case of Puerto Rico, uh, seven or eight more votes in the uh, uh, presidential sweepstakes. But both of those are going to require congressional action, and they would require um, the agreement of state legislatures if they were to be changed by virtue of a constitutional amendment, although Mm -hmm. the Congress does have the authority to admit new states. And that is, in fact, how all the states set up across the country historically became states. So there is at least an avenue for it, but it would happen in the midst of an enormous clamorous uh, debate about the nature of this. Uh, I'm not entirely sure Puerto Ricans would be delighted to pay federal income tax, but then I'm not Puerto Rican, so I don't know. Maybe maybe the right to vote would be more important. Um, the question of the electorate. Sorry, go ahead. No, that's fine. Carry on. Um, 
just have to slide that, turn that off so it doesn't make any more noise. Um, the electoral college system has been refined and reformed and changed several times uh, since it was first established based on that platonic model that we briefly touched on, in part because it became very clear that once political parties became an established feature in American life, uh, the, way it, the way it was arranged almost always could lead to grief. Uh, you could end up, in fact, with a president and a vice president from differing political parties if there was a tie between the presidential candidates. That obviously wasn't uh, seen by anybody as a, as a good plan. Um, there are proposals to, uh, to deal with electors, to turn them into absolute guaranteed ironclad required they must follow the vote of their state uh, in terms of how they vote at the presidential level. And in two states, Maine and Nebraska, there's an interesting experiment because there's no law that requires it be done the way it is done now in the other states. Uh, the voting in Nebraska and Maine is divided up by congressional district. Uh, so that if you win, and I, I'm trying to remember, I think there are, I think there are two congressional districts in Maine, um, and if you win in one of them, you get that one electoral vote, and if you win in the other, you get that one, and then if you win them both, then you get the bonus points. Uh, and Nebraska has a slightly different process, but there are also arguments that this should become a national project that every. So I think Brooks, I think the question is, is Biden brave enough to lead that process? Do you think that this is an issue for him or do you think that that's not really a priority? I mean, we have seen, we've, we've seen the Electoral College uh, since the Gore-Bush uh, election uh, as a, an issue that mm, causes yeah. friction. And I just wonder, you know, whether that's a politically unpopular cause to pursue and whether Biden would be brave enough to take it on. I think that was Roger's okay. thing. I don't Roger, want to spend too much more time because there's some other very interesting questions. So one minute on one, that. How's that? One last sentence. I, I think that these are perfect issues for Joe Biden to appoint a committee. And I wow. think that's, okay. that's kind of the way he he, he leads. You know, let's go study okay. this in depth and yeah. figure out how to do it. At, at least he set a time frame on that other committee, a certain number of days, and they must report back. Otherwise, it goes on ad nauseum. It looks like the question other, that I wanted to, yes. So the next question has to do with China. So two people have raised one is that uh, just that it's a very important issue, whether it's Biden or Trump. What will the future USA-China strategy look like? Um, and I think that a second more specific question is, what do you think Biden would do if China were to become aggressive toward Taiwan? Ooh, yes. Hmm. Okay, let's take the second one first, because it's much more apocalyptic. Okay. Um, <laughs> part, of the, um, part of the answer to that is, uh, that whatever China decides to do toward Taiwan, uh, they're going to have to decide to do something in which they have calculated it as a win. In other words, the worst possible outcome for China would be a war which doesn't end, in which an invasion is stopped, there are ships sunk in the Taiwan Straits, there are missiles being launched back and forth. Uh, that is the worst possible outcome for the Chinese because that puts a lie to uh, the larger Chinese policy that Taiwan is a renegade uh, province and it's, it should be uh, reunited with its brotherly provinces. Um, what would uh, either candidate do should they become, well, one of them obviously will, as, as they become president, uh, it's going to depend, A, a great deal on what the Chinese decide they want to do and the extent to which the Taiwanese decide they wish to respond uh, militarily or to acquiesce. 
But I think the real answer is that it's going to depend a great deal about the larger picture of U.S.-China relations. Mm. Uh, it, in other words, things in, in international affairs, as I, I know you know, they don't happen one little thing in isolation. They happen as part of a larger sense, either the decay of order or a a, a a, um, a, a military competition, either in terms of equipment or in terms of uh, development of new equipment, for the, the United States to ignore growing gradual threats toward Taiwan would be, I think, in domestic American political terms, unthinkable. For it to neglect or ignore the growing threat toward Taiwan by China would be to put all of the actual alliance relationships in East Asia with South Korea, with Japan, uh, the not quite alliances, but certainly the, the close relationships with the countries bordering the South China Sea and the basing agreements with Australia as well, uh, to acquiesce in the conquest or assimilation of Taiwan would be to put all of those other relationships, uh, at, to put them in play, to make them more difficult to, to maintain, because those countries would all see the writing on the wall that the United States doesn't exist as far as, as, far as these things are concerned as a real partner when it comes down to this kind of problem. Mm. The challenge is going to be to figure out how to avoid such a conflict rather than to respond to it after it occurs. Mm -hmm. uh, a footnote for me is simply that I think the first place to look for problems is not Taiwan, but the islands in the South China Sea, these little bitty fly speck islands where the Chinese yeah. have been very yeah. assiduously yeah. building up military. Mm -hmm. Um, and it bumps into uh, the American association, assertion that that is open water and therefore should uh, no, trans, no transit, either military or uh, commercial, should be obstructed because it is not the, the, uh, the, not the territorial sea of any nation. Mm -hmm. uh, the Chinese have argued otherwise. They've lost in a mar an international maritime court, uh, but that you know, the court doesn't really have the authority to enforce any of that. So it, I, I'm turning the question around, I think, because yeah. I think that's the closer uh, mm -hmm. conflict now. So the other question that had to do with uh, U.S. strategy, uh, whether under Biden or Trump post January 2021 going forward, um, I've seen another question that looks at China's role in Africa and whether or not the U.S. really has a strategy to counter the increasing influence of China and Africa, especially with the digital economy butting up as it is internationally. So that, that's another China question in one sense. Um, it's asking, do either Biden or Trump have a plan on how to reposition the U.S. for influence in a more digitized African future? Um, well, perhaps relative to China. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure uh, what a digitalized future for U.S.-Africa relationships means in any sort of precise way, but let me take a stab at this. Um, as it stands now, uh, the, the Trump administration appears to have virtually no U.S.-Africa policy. Um, and, I mean, the uh, putting aside the snide and scurrilous remarks uh, that the Trump uh, tweet, uh, Twitter stream seems to have inflicted on Africa. Um, basically, uh, that hasn't been an area of interest. Um, when the Trump administration took uh, office, I, I rather blithely thought that the, uh, the YALI program, the Young African Leader uh, program, the uh, uh, the Mandela scholars and such that would disappear because they would they're looking for any money they can save and that there's no particularly transactional value to the to America for that so they would just kill that off and one less thing to have to pay attention to <clears throat> excuse me 
Um, they didn't actually, uh, because I guess ultimately it didn't cost enough to be pay much attention to. Um, AGOA was there. Uh, it was going to outlast the Trump administration, at least the first one, if, if there is two, if there are two. Um, and uh, my, my view on AGOA under the Trump administration going forward is that the, it wouldn't happen. There might be other moves, but they would be very much in the nature of very strongly transactional trade negotiations, um, at least as tough as the one between the U.S. and Mexico and um, Canada, uh, or well, perhaps not as acrimonious as the one with China because the stakes were smaller, but smaller for the U.S., not for Africa. Um, the what, Biden, about the power, what about the Power Africa program? Did that die? No, it's still alive, actually. Okay. So that it, might be part of that. And that is an area where the Trump administration seems to be reasonably happy because it is a public-private partnership project. Mm -hmm. uh, for those who aren't familiar with Power Africa, uh, in very broad terms, it, it's, it's public funds and private funds and private initiatives to uh, bring electric power in various ways and, and, and sources to all those communities across the continent that currently do not have access to electrical power. Um, and uh, it, has, uh, it hasn't had huge successes because it really hasn't been designed to have earth shattering uh, outcomes, but smaller initiatives here, there, and the next place. Uh, and it still lives, and there are still projects going forward. Um, but I don't see the Trump administration. I have. I, I can't remember a statement from the White House on Power Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think they ever got around to saying anything about it. Uh, they did reform the various uh, financing mechanisms uh, for international investment by the United States. Uh, OPIC and the other ones, bring it, bringing them together into one newer body, which supposedly was going to make it more coherent and uh, leverage money more effectively. And I, the outcome of that is, I think, up for grabs. The Biden administration, should it come uh, to pass, would pay a little more attention to Africa simply because it would see issues of democracy and democratizing as in keeping with the kind of philosophy that it sees more generally. Um, but don't look for large new investments in foreign assistance. Certainly don't look for American investments under a Biden administration that would go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, dollar to, to renminbi uh, against Chinese uh, large-scale uh, infrastructure investments because realistically in the United States, there isn't that kind of money for, for doing that. As far as digitalization, gee, uh, I, one of the things that have always struck me about Africa generally, uh, and I'm being very, very broad sweep on this, is the high cost and the difficulty of getting uh, broadband connections anywhere I have been. It's hard. Now, I'm sure some places it's, it's much easier, but it's expensive, it's hard, it's spotty. Uh, but the saving grace for all of this might be that the continent is going to have, depending on how you count it, something like 500 million middle-class or middle-class aspirant younger people all desperate for mm -hmm. access to the goods and services that could flow by way of uh, digital commerce. And you would think that that would be something that the incoming Biden administration, should it exist, would glom right onto as a way of, uh, of exercising influence uh, in a cost-efficient kind of way. I hope that answers that a bit. Yep, thanks. Um, I've got an interesting one from Michael Power, who's obviously been uh, monitoring uh, the situation in the U.S. quite closely. 
He notes Donald Trump walked out of an interview he did with 60 Minutes that will air on Sunday. I don't know if you've heard about that, folks. Oh, yes. I have oh, not. Yes. Okay. It sounds as if things did not go well for him. Even if unexpectedly he does not upset things tonight, do you think he will upset things again on Sunday? So I guess the question is, how do you expect the debate to go? I've heard they're, they're, they've got slightly different rules and they can mute the one while the other is speaking, et cetera. How do you see the debate and also that 60 Minutes interview? Well, let's, let's go to 60 Minutes, first of all. Okay. Leslie Sullivan has been around for a long time as a reporter, and she's no slouch at asking hard questions. And she's, mm. she's gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with presidents for decades. So the, the, none of this is new territory for her. Mm -hmm. um, she asked tough pointed questions and Donald Trump clearly was looking for an excuse to, to get out of it and pointed to her at one time along the way and said, you're not wearing a mask. And he got up and left. Uh, now this, the interview was supposed to continue. Was he wearing a mask? Of course not. Mm. But you know, do as I say, not as I do. Mm -hmm. um, the interview was supposed to conclude with a walk around with the vice president, Mike Pence, where they would carry on further conversation and so forth. It was all supposed to be all friendly and warm and cuddly. Uh, and what he did, that is Donald Trump, he turned his, um, his explosion about this into the story rather than whatever it was he answered about whatever question there was. Uh, once again, uh, an own goal, uh, if you're keeping score that way. But again, I go back to the, the numbers we were talking about right at the beginning, that uh, by the time that interview airs this Sunday uh, on 60 Minutes, there will be over 50 million people who will have voted already. And so the pool of people who have yet to be convinced one way or the other and the pool of people who have yet to vote gets smaller and smaller every day. Uh, the studies seem to indicate that uh, Republican voters are more likely to show up at the polling booth on November 3rd than Democrats who are uh, large or increasingly choosing to elect to elect to vote by uh, advanced voting or mail-in balloting or absentee balloting, balloting. So its impact on the actual election is a little bit uncertain to me. Um, but the, um, I'm sorry, the other half of that was, help me out here, I lost it. Just going back to the debate and whether or not you, uh, he's sorry. likely to upset things uh, in the debate and whether they have changed the rules enough to avoid another debacle. Yeah, yeah um, the rules were changed so that the initial statement on any given topic, two minute statements, president, former vice president, vice, former vice president, president, uh, those two minutes, the other person's microphone will be muted. Please turn off your mic. Boom. Mm. Um, what that doesn't prevent, obviously, is the um, side by side look at uh, the, say, Joe Biden talking and Donald Trump going red in the face and scowling and uh, getting upset, but not able to say anything, champing at the bit and waiting for his moment. Mm. So it, it, it's, in a sense, it's going to be Donald Trump against Donald Trump more than it's going to be Donald Trump against Joe Biden. Can he maintain control? Now, the Trump, the Trump campaign only reluctantly gave in to that because they said, wait a minute, this is changing the rules that we have agreed to. Well, in point of fact, um, the original rules spoke to an uninterrupted two-minute time. Uh, they just, I don't think they accept, expected the idea that there would be constant interruptions right from the start. So, you know, in a way, it's a compromise that most adults could live with. Yeah. So there are a few more questions about uh, the sort of bigger implications of, of where U.S. politics has come the last few years. But there's a very good question for a foreign policy boss like you. Mm. Uh, what do you think the U.S. policy toward the Middle East is going to look like in the upcoming period? Um, you know, there's been quite a lot about uh, developments under Trump with Israel. What do you, how do you see the U.S. approach to the Middle East after this election? Okay. Um, what it will look like under, the, under a Trump administration, round two, is pretty easy to say. It will look like it did the first 
in the first administration, yeah. only more so. Uh, and that's because they have, if there is any part of the world where they have articulated a coherent vision, whether you like it or not, whether you agree with it or not, the vision that the Trump administration has set out about the Middle East is straightforward. Iran has to be contained and the way to do it is more and more tighter and tighter sanctions and eventually they'll scream and then they'll come back and uh, disgorge their missiles and give up on their uh, warheads if they ever have any and stop their nuclear program and that will be fine. The um, relationship uh, with the Israelis uh, probably cannot get all that much closer under a Trump administration round two because pretty much everything that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's uh, dream list, wish list, is being achieved. Uh, that there's, uh, I, I, the only things I can think of that aren't there yet are relations with Saudi Arabia, uh, ignoring the Palestinian question entirely, uh, getting along nicely, nicely with, uh, with Turkey in spite of its uh, authoritarian ruler, and convincing other countries like Sudan and Oman and Saudi Arabia even uh, to finally say, okay, we'll, we'll go along with relations with the Israelis as well. Those all appear to be part of the Trump progression of things. Um, for Biden, it's more of a challenge, actually, because the Democratic Party has traditionally, look at it historically at least, uh, been supportive uh, of, of Israel's place. And that has changed somewhat with the growth within the Democratic Party of a, a new far left group that is pushing hard to decouple US policy from unwavering, complete, total, uh, unquestioning support to the Israelis on almost any grounds. Uh, and the Trump, uh, sorry, excuse me, the Biden view of it um, doesn't appear to be either of those two extremes. Uh, again, Joe Biden is a man of moderate taste and moderate policies and uh, a lover of study groups. Um, what the Biden policy statements have included is that right at the beginning, they would work to uh, re-engage with Iran and rejoin the six power agreement on Iran's nuclear efforts. Um, I think, I'm guessing, I haven't talked to too many Iranians, uh, I have spoken about it with some people, but that the um, the Iranians would be interested in that as it includes rolling back and unraveling some of this web of sanctions and uh, dealing with the Iranians on an equal basis rather than issuing you know commands mm -hmm. and at the same time recognizing Iran's place in the Middle East as a major force in the region and accepting that. That would be the Iranian position. And so the, a, a Biden administration would have to figure out how to, how to finesse all those parts. Um, as far as the Israelis go, uh, what you won't see is a reversal of where the embassy is officially situated or that recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. That's not going to be part of the, the Biden administration administration agenda either. Mm. By the same token, um, you probably will see much more effort than we have over the last four years of a Biden administration trying to figure out how to reinsert the idea of negotiations and building some sort of common joint future, Israel, Palestinians, uh, in some way, shape, or form. But those are, I mean, the, part of it is we don't have enough evidence from them, the Biden, Biden administration to come to be able to say precisely that's what they would do. But I'm guessing on the basis of what I've read from, from them, 
that's kind of where they're situated. Okay, thank you. Now, a couple of questions address the perceived decline of the West and the sense that a country that could elect somebody like Donald Trump in 2016 surely has lost its bearings. So one is, uh, with all the checks and balances and oversight committees in the US government system to prevent nepotism, unethical and unprofessional behavior and such antics, we have been witness to over the last three years by the current president, how is the system going to prevent such a shambolic presidency being repeated? So she's asking, this is Sue Charlton, how, how can going forward, uh, in, basically how can re institutions be strengthened again to bring into uh, the US into more of a sense of equilibrium? I think uh, she's concerned with how that's going to be addressed going forward in order to protect the US standing globally and to prevent, to prevent uh, the basically the antics of somebody like uh, Trump. The other point from Anthony Silverberg is similar, and that is um, how can the West survive? Are we seeing the decline of the West? He sees the real issue as the viability of the democratic system, um, and that Trump's presidency has demonstrated that that is being undermined. So those are, those are big ideas, and uh, the decline of the West has been uh, discussed for at least 30 years um, and so I'm, I'm sure it's not uh, a surprise to policy pundits that it's but but I think the Trump presidency has thrown a new light on what that means for the US how can you comment or a shadow on it maybe, I think more than yeah uh, uh, re returning to that Middle East question for just a second one of the oh, things sure. we, we left out was Syria mm. And there, the problem is not so much what, what transpires in Syria itself, as much as how does the, uh, the, the American president, whoever he is, figure out a way to uh, react to the Russian uh, engagement there. Um, this, uh, Syria is the, Russia's partner, child, ally, satrapy, depending on how you like to look at it, good and proper. And uh, for all intents and purposes, the Americans have, have surrendered any possibility of leverage over, over Syria, realistically, and getting some, <clears throat> some of it back or dealing with the Russians there is, is a challenge. But that's going to affect Iraq, Israel, Lebanon, Turkey. So I'm glad that's not my job to solve that problem. Perhaps, um, perhaps the new president needs to rebuild the State Department so that that sort of policy making can take place. That is a fact. I haven't seen that in the questions, but you and I both know that's been under attack. Under that would be a real help, and it would be help to have a certain continuity in the uh, National Security Council, National Security Advisors staffing and not keep throwing people overboard every every year and replacing them and whenever someone comes in with information you don't like you don't you don't accuse them of being some you know somebody that has to be replaced immediately by tomorrow morning uh, part of being a president is knowing how to take advice from people who know more about something than you do because you can't be assuming that you know everything there is to know about everything that's one reason why you have staff that's true of every organization, but it's particularly true of being a president. Um, the decline of the West. Well, I mean, we've been writing and reading about the decline of the West since uh, Oswald Spengler mm -hmm. in 1922, 21. Um, now, I mean, his version of it uh, had particular racial tinges to it, so you know, maybe he isn't the best guide. Um, but it's it's been quite a roller coaster and. In 2000, uh, if you were to read the triumphalist literature uh, that stemmed out of a slight misreading of Francis Fukuyama's book, The End of History, 
you would have come away with the conclusion that, okay, folks, we drew a line under history and it's all been solved. Liberal democracy is in charge. Uh, greater uh, internationalization is part of that. The globalized trading system is what we all desire and want to build toward. And although there'll be some conflicts based on ethnicity or race or religion, they're at the periphery and we can handle them. And the key issue is going to be how to how to bring China back, bring it into uh, the international uh, system as a stable, senior, committed stakeholder. That was something of the Obama uh, feeling. And how to continue the democratic revolution in Russia such that they became a supporter of it rather than a, you know, a dog in the manger to the process. Hmm. And that hasn't worked out as well as people thought obviously. And dealing, one of the things that the Biden article that we quoted from talked about is one of his early pledges appears to be to convene a conference of democracies to begin to find out once again what democracies share and how that sphere of uh, democratic values can be expanded again and how it can be supported in other places and encouraged and nurtured and loved. Um, a committee again, I guess. <laughs> Here we are, poor Joe Biden, he's really on the committee thing. Um, but one of the things that what the last 10 years certainly have taught us is that, um, well, you really have to be careful about anticipating the logical continuity of things from what had gone on before. You have to really be concerned with where are the disjunctures, where are the things, the unexpected, those black swan events or other kinds of swans. Uh, and part of the problem is that, and I'll betray my feelings quite obviously, uh, the four years of the Trump administration have done very little to help any of that and a great deal to make it more difficult. Railing at your allies, whether they're in East Asia or in Western Europe or North America, is not the way you promote cooperation. And one of the things the Biden paper spoke to was in dealing with China, what will be crucial will be bringing together on a common basis all of the major trading partners with China so that there was a common framework and a common set of plans, proposals, initiatives, and demands. Uh, mm -hmm. Not the least of which probably would be along the lines of, you really must stop violating copyrights. You really must stop uh, insisting on what amounts to fire sale, uh, sales mm -hmm. of shares in uh, foreign companies. Uh, you really must, um, allow the companies to operate with a transparent set of, a tra in, in a transparent legal framework and uh, all the rest of that, uh, none of which is easily and obviously clear now. Um, and I, I get one of the sort of the hidden assumptions there is once the Chinese get to know and love all this, they will want more of it, uh, whether that's Chinese, true or not. You mean the Chinese population? Uh, Chinese population and perhaps reluctantly the leadership as well. Oh, okay. Um, I think that's an implicit feeling in there that once once they come to accept this, that they will move in that general direction and all's right with the world again. Um, oh. But the the Biden paper also says, look, we've gone through a bad patch. Uh, it's now more difficult to do any of this than it would have been four years ago, ten years ago. And uh, what we have to do now is the EU, the East Asian uh, large economies, Canada, the US, other, other people, the, the, um, the positions have to be consistent, they have to be mutually agreed on, and we have to put the pressure on precisely. Now that's not going to sit well with the Chinese, obviously but the Chinese appear to be infinitely adjustable and, and uh, flexible on the way in which they deal with other countries too. They have their needs and their interests. 
uh, but they've been around a long time as a as a society. I, 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 not, just for the sake of argument, uh, I once had a, a discussion with an American diplomat in Japan uh, who was remarking on the the quality of a particular Chinese diplomat. We were both watching a conference, and he said, gosh, they're really good at this. And I looked at him and I said, you know, they've been at it for about 4,000 years. They've got some practice. Yeah. They figured out how to do this. And it's true. I mean, they really, you know, they take a long view. They, their, their time horizon is not the four-year time horizon like mm. the Americans yeah. are. Their time horizon is a century, maybe? Mm. Because they're still looking backward at the century of humiliation. So yeah. looking forward, the century of ascendancy, perhaps. Does that help? Uh, yes. We have a, a question that brings us back to the elections uh, themselves, and uh, it has to do with this uh, perception that has been created, I don't know how strongly by Donald Trump or just by uh, the media, that he might resist a transition of power. And the question is, do you see this election ending up in the courts in the event that President Trump loses? and calls into question the validity of the count uh, and on that basis refuses to leave the office, what legal recourse do the Democrats have? Okay. I'm gonna go way, way out on the limb on this. Okay. I mean, very tiny limb, you know, going like this now on that limb. Um, look, Donald Trump is, is your classic bully and that's how he's conducted his business over the years, and that's how he's largely conducted his presidency. And to the extent to which he can make it, make people feel that if he doesn't get his way, uh, he'll contest it and fight it tooth and nail right down to the last molecule. Um, he sees that as a winning strategy, perhaps even to the point of turning around the results. But let's get real. Um, in the big states, in Illinois, New York, California, um, the results will be clear. The Democrats will win those states. There's, that's not a question. Uh, in the Midwest, uh, the, uh, many of the smaller states, the Republicans will be triumphant and in a chunk of the South. Realistically, the only places where we're really, really going to have this drawn out struggle, Florida, maybe Pennsylvania, and perhaps, maybe, Wisconsin, maybe Michigan, uh, and just possibly North Carolina. But, but Brooke, do you remember what happened with Al Gore? No, oh, I can't and forget did that. Go, yeah, it did go to the courts, and then it became evident that it was going to take such a long time. And my recollection of the way things unfolded is that Gore actually conceded the election in the interest of the U.S. Uh, moving forward. He did not want to see the inauguration date arrive and no decision being made. That was unprecedented. So he conceded, even though, you know, it was uncertain. Um, it, it was apparently evident he had the popular vote, but it, again, it was the electoral college votes that were uncertain. So, you know, a bully can sometimes make that sort of thing happen, even if institutions are there to create a path forward in the case that there's a contested outcome. What, what I was going to say was the, the, the real place where we're going to see this is probably the same place we saw it in 2000. And that's Florida. Florida. Yeah. Because it's, it's a big state, 29 electoral votes, I think now. Uh, it's, a, it's a state in which there is no one predominant socioeconomic group. I mean, it's as if there are six Floridas. Um, and each of them, each of the groups has a very different take on who is right for the presidency. And they, I mean, the Democrats surely have learned from the experience of, of watching those rooms of people holding up the, the Hollerith cards, looking to see whether or not that little piece of paper has gone through or was just bumped or has it detached or what have you, those famous photographs that we're never going to be able to forget. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's going to be an enormous amount of watching and waiting and looking, but it's going to be nibbling at the edges because uh, there will be enormous numbers of votes that will already have been cast 
uh, on paper by advance and uh, absentee and uh, mail-in ballots. And so it's, it, it's going to be much less the question of did he or didn't he or was that butterfly ballot something that confused the little old ladies in Boca Raton mm. about whether they were voting for Red, uh, what's his name, Pat Buchanan or uh, Al Gore, which was one of the complaints, in fact. Um, and I think when it comes down to it, we're going to be looking at results, you, me, everybody else, November 3rd. Uh, and once the balloting totals begin to get reported in places like Pennsylvania and Florida and Virginia and North Carolina along the East Coast, we're going to either know that the trend is really significant toward Joe Biden or we're in for a long period of counting and recounting and um, arguing and squabbling. Um, my guess is we're going to go to the former rather than the latter, but that's just a guess. That's a good optimistic take on things. We've come to, to the end of our question time. I just need to wrap up with a few comments. Thank you so much, Brooks, for bringing your insights and great that you were able to uh, explain a few things there from your long years of studying the US system and also working from outside the US system as a foreign service officer, you would, uh, that brings a new perspective. So I, I think that the things that I will be watching for, uh, based on what you've discussed, are the, 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 the swing states and what's going to be happening in Georgia and all those other ones that you mentioned. I'm surprised you didn't mention Ohio, by the way. I thought Ohio was one of those definite swing states, but maybe not this time. I'm sorry. I should have mentioned it. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Oh, that's fine. And then um, just the, the polling question, I'm glad you brought it up. And I do think it's important to just remind ourselves that, you know, polls can mislead and what you said, they're not predictive, they're descriptive. That's a very important point. So thank you for that. Um, we need to keep watching them day by day, also take into account the margin of error and all the other demographics that can come in. I know the economist sort of discounts by 2% just because they know that these polls cannot be that accurate. Um, and yeah, the, the big questions, how will, how will the two candidates handle uh, the, pen, the questions tonight in the debate on the economy, on health care, if they are able to actually substantively debate as opposed to uh, bully one another like last time. Um, I'll be watching for those. I don't know if we'll be up at 2 a.m., but I'll definitely be watching it, uh, the replays tomorrow. So if you have any good insights, you can you can send an email at 3 a.m. How's that? Um, but I, I think that uh, judging from the questions, um, there is an expectation that we might just see change in the US and that um, you know, the topic of this talk was also just how will that affect the rest of us? And I do think that that in a way the US still has a role to play. Uh, in the world economy, uh, if less in many of the other um, sectors that it has led in the past. And uh, that will hopefully be good news for South Africa going forward, um, that we have somebody that's willing to look at multilateral solutions, somebody willing to consider Africa as, a, as one of the regions that remains important for US attention. So with that in mind, Thank you for your insights, and we hope that we will, none of us, get quite the shock that we got in 2016. <laughs> so I thank you. And no, thanks thank everyone you. for participating. I'm sorry if I didn't get to all your questions. Um, please feel free to send a few uh, emails to Pippa if you really think a question needs to be answered. Maybe Brooks will entertain those. Happy uh, to post facto. So I um, I thank you and I say good night. Pepper, do you want to just uh, fill us in on the procedure from here? Thanks, Brooks and Martha. I'm going to now end the meeting. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.